morning uh, and welcome to the first webinar in Take Actions uh, Inside Weed Management webinar series. I think it's 11 a.m. and we'll get started. My name is Zuhur Ghani and I'm your host for today. On behalf of USHRAC, uh, United States Herbicide Resistance Action Committee. So I will give a little background about USHRAC and Take Action before we uh, turn it over to the speaker of today. So USHRAC is an industry group operated by uh, technical members from uh, different ag companies represented in Crop Life America. And USHRAC has a mission to fight uh, herbicide resistance. And uh, we support and create awareness about integrated weed management tools available to manage uh, our current resistant weed, uh, weed problems. And we promote uh, proper product stewardship to delay the evolution of new herbicide resistant issues. And we have, you know, we uh, achieve our goals by engaging ourselves uh, ourselves with the regulatory uh, agencies to refine some of the regulatory requirements uh, for herbicide resistance management. And we also uh, work with different stakeholders like uh, WSSA, Global HRAC, and uh, you know, different university professors, uh, extension uh, educators, and and. Uh, commodity groups to generate some of the educational material for herbicide resistance management. And, and we sponsor and we support and we create awareness about, you know, these herbicide resistance uh, management uh, programs. So this webinar and all other webinars in this series are brought to you by USHRAC in collaboration with Take Action. Take Action is a farmer focused uh, education platform designed to help farmers manage herbicide fungicide and insecticide resistance. The goal is to help farmers like you adopt management practices that reduce the impacts of resistant pests and preserve current and future um, crop protection uh, technologies and tools. The program is an industry-wide collaboration, including representatives from major ag chemical companies, land-grant university weed scientists like Pat uh, Trenel that you will be hearing in a few minutes and uh, commodity boards uh, and agricultural industry organizations like HRAC. So our presenter today is uh, Dr. P Pat Trenel from University of Illinois. Pat was raised on a crop and livestock farm in Northern Illinois. He received his uh, BS, MS and PhD degrees from Iowa State, Washington State and Michigan State Universities respectively. And Pat joined uh, University of Illinois in 1997, where he runs a lab um, where they use molecular and genomics tools to address weed science issues. His lab is internationally recognized for its numerous contributions uh, uh, that have increased our understanding of evolution and underlying mechanisms of herbicide uh, resistance. Pat collaborates with uh, different weed scientists at University of uh, Illinois and elsewhere, fostering a research program that's timely and relevant to weed management practitioners. And uh, during this uh, sem you know, webinar, uh, please feel free to add your questions in the chat box. Uh, we'll uh, you know, keep monitoring them and, and we'll have some time to address them at the end of this uh, uh, webinar. And, and with that, I will turn it over to Pat. Pat, go ahead. All right. Well, thank you, Zahor, for that introduction. Let me bring up my screen. <clears throat> so good morning, everyone. And thank you again for the introduction. Thank you to USA Track and Take Action for uh, hosting this webinar and giving me this opportunity to talk with all of you today about metabolic herbicide resistance. I think this is a very important topic for weed management, and I appreciate you all taking the time to, to hear about this, and hopefully I'll convince you as to why this is important from a practical standpoint in trying to manage our, manage our weeds today. So here's an overview of where I'm headed today. I'm gonna to first just remind all of you of the importance of herbicide resistance and why this is a challenge. And then before I get into metabolic resistance, I want to, place that in the context of our other type of resistance, target site resistance that we, we dealt with uh, more regularly and is probably more familiar to many of us. And so I'll talk about target site resistance and then compare and contrast metabolic resistance with the target site resistance. And I'll explain what that is. And 
I'll warn you up front here, we're going to get a little bit into some, some scientific details and, and background behind these different resistance mechanisms. And the, the reason for that is important, uh, I think, because I want you to, if you understand the reasoning and the, the, the basic science behind these resistance mechanisms, I think that'll give you a better appreciation and a better understanding for the practical implications of these different types of resistances. And so, again, I'll, I'll get a little bit into the science here, but trust me at the end here, uh, during the last half or so, we're really gonna focus on the practical implications of this herbicide resistance and what it means to you trying to manage the weeds out there in your field. So we can define herbicide resistance. There's lots of different definitions for purpose of today. I'm just gonna think about it uh, ask you to think about it as a decrease in effectiveness of a herbicide on a weed population. And oftentimes, not just a decrease in effectiveness, but a complete loss of effectiveness of a particular herbicide on a particular weed population. And today, when I'm talking about populations of weeds, I'm talking about a field, field level. So a population of weeds would be the weeds that you have in your field. And this decrease in effectiveness of a herbicide, this process of herbicide resistance occurs uh, as a result of evolution, it's simple selection, survival of the fittest, and evolution. And so repeated exposures of our herbicides to our populations results in these populations becoming less and less uh, sensitive to those herbicides. This is definitely not a new problem. Herbicide resistance has been with us for, for decades, but it is a problem that continues to become more common and continues to, to grow. And this is well illustrated by this graph from a website, which is also sponsored by USA Track. Um, and this simply shows, this graph shows the increasing number of cases of herbicide resistance uh, globally over time. And for the purpose of this slide, a case of herbicide resistance is defined as a particular species of a weed that's resistant to a particular herbicide or a group of herbicides. And what you can see is, again, this isn't a new problem. This has been with us for decades. And the other important take home of this slide is that this is a linear process, okay? It shows no signs of slowing down. If you look at the top of the graph here, it might look like it's starting to level off a little bit, but that's really just an artifact of the, the fact that it takes a couple years for new cases to be documented and, and reported. So really this is a linear process, shows no signs of slowing down. Herbicide resistance is, is with us to stay and it's gonna continue to become more common. And so to give you a sort of a tangible uh, illustration of some of the challenges this poses, I'm going to turn to my favorite weed here in Illinois and in the Midwest is, is water hemp. And so this weed, water hemp, has been documented to now have evolved resistance to herbicides spanning seven different site of action groups. So these would be, if you're familiar with the herbicide group numbers, group numbers 2, 4, 5, 9, 14, 15, and 27. And so if you are in the Midwest and you're familiar with herbicide options for, for weed control and specifically water hemp control in corn and soybeans, you look across this list of herbicides and this is pretty much all of them. Okay, not quite all of them, but this is pretty almost all of the herbicides that are options that for effective water hemp control in corn and soybeans. And so this is a real challenge. We're, we're literally running out of herbicide options. And it's also important to point out that if we had water hemp population that was resistant just to the group two herbicides, we wouldn't be too concerned about it because there'd be lots of other groups that we could use. But what we're increasingly seeing is populations of water hemp that have resistance to more than one group, okay? And so, in fact, it's almost impossible now to find a water hemp population that's sensitive to all herbicides, okay? essentially every water hemp population is resistant to at least one herbicide group. And most populations are resistant to two, three, four, uh, five groups. And in the worst case scenario, we have a couple water hemp populations. So again, I'm talking about a single field within a single field, there's water hemp in that field that's resistant to all uh, or to six of the seven groups to which water hemp has evolved resistance. So again, the point is that in some of these weed species, we are literally running out of effective herbicide options. So herbicide resistance clearly is a concern. It's, it's making it very challenging to manage some of these tough weeds. And if you're not in the Midwest and you think, well, I don't have water hemp. Well, every region, every region in the United States that has significant you know, crop production acres, those regions have one or more species that is, I could essentially tell a similar story 
that I told for water hemp. So for example, many regions have Palmer amaranth, also has common uh, resistance, widespread resistance, and, and multiple resistance in a lot of populations. If you're out from the Great Plains, for example, kochia is sort of your water hemp, where we could tell a similar story about widespread common resistance and often multiple resistance within single populations. So that's just kind of a, a backdrop to get us on the same page here about the, the challenge of herbicide resistance. And so now what I wanna do is talk about the mechanisms of, of two major types of resistance, target site resistance, explain that and some of the implications of that, and then turn to metabolic resistance and compare and contrast that. And so with target site resistance, I'm just gonna give you a little cartoon here to, to illustrate how target site resistance works, okay? And so what I'm, what I'm showing here in this cartoon is a, an example biochemical pathway. So all organisms, weeds included, have lots of biochemical pathways, processes that take place, that have to take place in order for that organism to, to grow and survive. And herbicides target these pathways, okay? And so here's an example pathway where there's an enzyme which takes some substrate to make some product that's an essential product for that plant to, to live and grow. And so what herbicides do is herbicides bind an enzyme in one of these essential biochemical pathways. And when that herbicide binds that enzyme, it prevents that enzyme from doing its job. This essential product is not created. And so the plant dies. Okay, so that's very simply, that's how herbicides work. They bind the target, usually an enzyme, and kill the plant. Well, what happens with target site resistance is we have a mutation in the gene that encodes this particular enzyme or that particular target site of the herbicide. And that mutation changes the structure of that enzyme. Okay, so in this cartoon example, you can see how because of this change in the structure of the enzyme, the herbicide can't bind to it anymore. And so this is simply, this is target site resistance. There's a change in the enzyme, change in the, the site of action or change in the target site of the herbicide, which prevents or reduces the binding of the herbicide to that enzyme. So now the plant, even in the presence of that herbicide can still go along its merry way and make this essential product in this particular pathway. So that's target site resistance. And so one of the key uh, implications or outcomes of this target site resistance is that when you have target site resistance to one herbicide, that plant also typically is going to be resistant to herbicide to other herbicides that have or that share that same target site. Okay, so herbicides from the same group number. An example of this would be simply if you had a weed that had target site resistance to cobra, which is a group 14 herbicide, that plant probably would also be resistant to Flexstar because Flexstar is also a group 14 herbicide and Flexstar and Cobra have the same target site. Importantly though, this target site resistance does not confer resistance to herbicides with other target sites, okay? That's very important. So when you have target site resistance and just target site resistance, that's relatively easy to manage. All you have to do is mix and rotate herbicides from different groups or herbicides with different target sites, okay? If you have resistance to one target site and, and that's the only type of resistance you have, a uh, herbicide from another target site will control that weed. And if we use herbicides in mixtures and annual rotations that have different target sites, that will very effectively delay or slow down the evolution of target site resistance. And this, this lack of cross resistance to herbicides with other sites of action is exactly why the Take Action Group has produced this herbicide classification chart. This color coded chart groups herbicides by their different target sites. And so it makes it easier for farmers to, to look at this and say, okay, if I'm using this herbicide, what target site am I using? What, what, what enzyme am I targeting? Without, you don't have to know the specific herbicide, you just know it's a, a, a group. And so using herbicides from these different groups and these different colors is a very effective way of managing target site resistance. Okay, so that's target site resistance. Now let's shift gears and talk about metabolic resistance and tell you, I'll first talk about what this is and then we'll talk about its implications. And so metabolic resistance is simply a different mechanism by which weeds can evolve 
uh, resistance to herbicides, okay? Uh, there's several non-target site mechanisms, but the most important one that we're gonna be talking about today is this, this mechanism of increased herbicide metabolism or increased herbicide detoxification. The plant is able to metabolize or detoxify or break down that herbicide. And this idea of herbicide metabolism is certainly not new to us. It's in fact, in most cases, the reason why a herbicide can be used in a crop and that herbicide will kill the weeds and not the crop. And so when a company is trying to develop a new herbicide, they're screening for herbicides that kill the weeds and not the crop. And then the reason they find out later that, that the, the herbicide is not killing the crop is because the crop is able to detoxify that herbicide, get rid of the herbicide before it has a chance to kill the plant. Okay, so a, a very common example of this would be atrazine does not kill corn because corn is able to detoxify that atrazine herbicide molecule before the atrazine has time to kill the corn. Okay, and so this, I wanna talk a little bit about the details of herbicide metabolism, not, not going into all the details, but pointing out a few, a few important features that are important to understanding the implications of this metabolic resistance. So one important point is that it's a multi-step process, okay? And so we do, this process goes from what we call the parent molecule, which was the, the, the herbicide that's actually you know, sprayed on the plant, that's the parent. And then that parent molecule is broken down into various other uh, compounds, which we call metabolites. And again, this is a multi-step process. And there's not just one step where the parent goes to being completely detoxified. It's, it's a series of steps. And as you go down these series of steps, these metabolites typically will have decreasing toxicity to the plant, and they also have increasing water solubility. And, and the, this increasing water solubility just means that it becomes stepwise more and more available to be targeted by other enzymes that participate in this multi-step process. So it's a multi-step process that can involve more than one enzyme. And in fact, it can involve many different enzymes. Okay, and so these multi -step, this multi-step process can be broken down into four different phases. And again, I'm not gonna go into all the details here. Again, the key take home is that there's lots of different steps and there's different phases and there's different enzymes contributing to these different phases. Okay, and here's a schematic or a cartoon depiction of some of these, of these four different phases. And it shows some of the major players. So cytochrome P450 is abbreviated here simply P450 is an important player in this process. GSTs, glutathione as transferases, another important player. Um, transporter proteins are another important players. So again, multi-step process with several important players along this pathway. And just to give you an example, might help to see what, what this looks like. So here's one of, of several steps in the degradation of the herbicide 2,4-D. So this is the parent molecule, and this is one metabolite where a P450 adds a hydroxy group to this molecule that decreases the toxicity of this molecule and having a hydroxy group here makes it more uh, water soluble, makes it more accessible to other enzymes that can further work on this metabolite to, to break it down further into smaller metabolites that will be even less toxic. And then here's another example of a GST mediated conjugation step. So this is the parent molecule atrazine plant can recognize this. Uh, some plants can recognize this molecule and they will attach this, this compound called glutathione to the parent molecule. And this glutathione acts as a tag for the plant. It's kind of a messenger. And it says this thing that this glutathione is attached to, in this case, this atrazine is a bad thing for me as a plant. And so I need to get rid of it. And so this glutathione will target it for subsequent degradation. So again, multi-step process, different enzymes contribute to this process. Okay, and so um, you might be thinking, so there's all these different enzymes that can metabolize herbicides. And you know this doesn't really make sense because plants evolved a long time ago before farmers or anyone else was spraying herbicides. So why do these plants have all these enzymes that can metabolize herbicides when they evolved in an environment when, when herbicides weren't used? Well, it turns out that these enzymes, they're not really in the plant specifically to metabolize herbicides. They're, the reason plants have these enzymes are for other processes. So they, these may be primary biochemical processes 
Maybe some of these enzymes are involved in producing compounds that the plant needs to grow and live. Some of these enzymes that can metabolize herbicides are important for, for the plant responding to environmental stresses. And then also, even though plants didn't evolve in a world of herbicides, they did evolve in a world where there were other compounds that were toxic to them. So for example, some microorganisms produce compounds that are toxic to plants. And so for plants to coexist with these microbes, they had to evolve enzymes that could metabolize some of these microbial toxins. And so it just turns out that these same enzymes that perform these other steps in plants some of these enzymes just happen more or less by chance to be able to also work on herbicide molecules. And as I mentioned, there are many players, okay? So I mentioned the cytochrome P450s and glutathione S transferases that are able to metabolize some of these herbicides. And the important thing to realize is that plants don't have just one cytochrome P450 or just one glutathione S transferase. Plants have lots of these different enzymes. And so this is one uh, tally from a, a model species where this model species had dozens, if not hundreds of these different types of enzymes, okay? Any of which potentially could be able to metabolize a herbicide. So the point is the plant has lots of these enzymes that potentially might be able to metabolize a herbicide. So the more you have, the more likely it will be by chance that one of them will be able to metabolize or work on some particular herbicide molecule. And so when we talk about metabolic resistance or a weed evolving metabolic resistance, what happens is that weed uh, develops the ability to metabolize a herbicide that it couldn't previously metabolize, or maybe it can metabolize it previously, but not very quickly. And so the herbicide would kill the plant before it can metabolize. It. But what happens is the plant eat evolves the ability to metabolize that herbicide faster. And so for example, maybe the plant already has a P450 that can metabolize a herbicide, but it only does it uh, quite slowly. And so the, the herbicide still kills the plant. But if the plant produces more of that P450 enzyme, so it overexpresses a gene that encodes that enzyme, and now it's producing a lot of that enzyme, now maybe that plant can metabolize that herbicide fast enough such that it could survive before the, it, it could get rid of the herbicide and survive before the herbicide would have a chance to kill it, okay? So that'd just be one potential example, change in a plant, that'd be the, the evolution that would result in this metabolic resistance. Or another example might be, maybe a plant has a GST that doesn't recognize a herbicide. It can almost recognize it, but not quite recognize it. Maybe you have a little mutation in that GST, so now it can recognize that herbicide and work on it. Okay. And so those are potential different ways by which the herbicide or the weed can evolve to metabolize the herbicide and therefore have this metabolic resistance. And the other thing that I want to point out is, as I, as I mentioned and stressed, this herbicide metabolism is a multi-step process. So there's lots of enzymes that can, can be involved. And what happens is you can have, because of these multiple steps, you can combine multiple different players that each can contribute to the metabolism of the herbicide, okay? So maybe it's not just one P450 that's causing the metabolic resistance, but maybe it's a P450 plus a GST plus an ABC transporter protein, all of which work together to get rid of that herbicide faster, okay? So that's a little bit about the, the background, at least enough that we need today in terms of understanding metabolic resistance. And so now I wanna bring this all together and get to the most important part of this talk, this webinar, talk about what does this mean to you as a grower as you're trying to manage your weeds. And so reason number one as to why you should be concerned and, and, and be aware of this metabolic resistance is that it confers very unpredictable cross resistance. And so I talked about target site resistance, and I talked about that if you have target site resistance, that's likely going to confer cross resistance to herbicides with the same site of action. And so that's predictable cross resistance. Okay, if I had group two resistance to a group two herbicide, I probably have resistance to other group two herbicides. With metabolic resistance, though, it's a very different story. The cross resistance is to herbicides with a similar molecular handle, okay? And I'll explain a little bit and give you an example of what I mean by molecular handle. But the point is it doesn't really matter what the target site is, what the site of action of the herbicide is. 
you cannot use site of action of the herbicide to predict whether there will be cross resistance if it's due to metabolism, okay? And unfortunately, we're currently not at the point, we don't have enough understanding of this metabolic resistance to be able to accurately predict the molecular handles, which would allow us to accurately predict the pattern of cross resistance, okay? So let me illustrate this here with what I mean by like a molecular handle. And so this illustration or this example is actually a commercial example of metabolic cross resistance. Okay, so this comes from the Enlist uh, technology and the, the Enlist crops. So Enlist crops have been genetically engineered to contain an enzyme that's able to metabolize 2,4-D. Okay, and so this enzyme that metabolizes 2,4-D, it, it acts on this part of the molecule where this red arrow is. Well, it turns out that this enzyme that can act on 2,4-D also can act on quizalifop. Okay, now quizalifop and 2,4-D are very different herbicides. 2,4-D is a, a group four herbicide that targets broadleaf weeds primarily. Quizalifop, which you may know better as Assure 2, is a group, uh, a group one herbicide, which primarily targets grass weeds. So very different herbicides. But it turns out that this part of the molecule is quite similar between the two. And so this is what I mean by a molecular handle. These herbicides have completely different target sites, but they do share this molecular handle which allows this a common enzyme to be able to operate and detoxify both of these. And so Enlist technology has not only resistance to 2,4-D, but it also has resistance to these quizalifop or, or to the FOP herbicides, okay, which is a, a category of group one herbicides. Now, you might look at this and say, well, we could predict this because those molecular handles look pretty similar, right? And maybe that's true in this case, but in this case, we actually know how the enzyme and where the enzyme is targeting the herbicide, okay? Typically when a weed has metabolic resistance, as I mentioned, there's lots of different enzymes that could be working on that herbicide. We typically don't know which one it is. We don't know what the molecular handle is on the molecule that that weed is targeting. And so we don't, aren't able typically to predict the cross resistance that maybe you could have in this case here where you have more knowledge of what's going on. Okay, so that's an example, a, a commercial example, uh, sort of a human made uh, cross resistance, metabolic resistance. Uh, an example from a weed, kind of a, an extreme example recently reported here uh, is a, a population of late water grass, water grass, which you may not be familiar with, but it's a relative of barnyard grass. This weed evolved metabolic resistance and it evolved metabolic resistance by expressing a cytochrome P450 and it turns out that this one cytochrome P450 was able to metabolize 16 different herbicides spanning six different site of action groups. Okay, so very unpredictable. Okay, how do you manage this type of resistance? How do you rotate or mix herbicides when you can't predict which herbicides this, this one enzyme, this one mechanism could confer resistance to? So that really illustrates this challenge of this unpredictable cross resistance. And so because of that, Unlike target site resistance, we can't simply mix and rotate herbicides to manage metabolic resistance because we can't predict which herbicides we should use. Okay, so this, this, this chart, which works great for managing target site resistance, really does not help us for managing metabolic resistance. And so it's kind of a big black box right now in terms of how should we be mixing and rotating herbicides to try to delay metabolic resistance. Okay, so that's one reason to be concerned about metabolic resistance. The second reason is that this metabolic resistance is definitely on the rise. This is becoming much more common. Okay, and to illustrate this, I'll turn back again to my favorite weed, water hemp. And so if we go back in time about a decade and we look at, you know, back in 2010, 2011, what herbicide resistances were we dealing with? We had resistance to four different groups and in most cases, the mechanism of resistance was target site. So back you know, in 2010, 2011, when we were telling farmers how to manage resistance in water hemp, our, our big message was mix and rotate herbicides from different sites of action, because that's what we had to deal with was target site resistance. Now, a decade later, all new mechanisms of herbicide resistance that we've identified in, the in water hemp in the last decade have been metabolic mechanisms. 
Okay, so this is a complete shift in the landscape in terms of what we're dealing with in terms of herbicide resistance in water hemp. 10 years ago, it was almost all target site resistance. Now it's predominantly metabolic resistance. Okay, the target site resistance hasn't gone away. It's still there. We still have to worry about that. But on top of that now, we have to worry about all this metabolic resistance. So in fact, of the, of the seven different types of herbicide resistance that water hemp has, you know, or groups of herbicides to which water hemp has evolved resistance, we have metabolic mechanisms for all of those. Whereas we only have in water hemp, water hemp only has a target site resistance for, for, for four of the seven. So again, complete landscape shift in that now metabolic resistance in water hemp is really what we need to be worrying about and trying to manage. Okay, reason number three, these weed populations are steadily accumulating different herbicide metabolism genes. Okay, and so this is where I really wanted to, or why I wanted to emphasize this idea about there's multiple players in herbicide metabolism. And that because of that, because this is a multi-step process, there's the opportunity for plants to accumulate several of these players. And as they accumulate more than one of these players, they accumulate two P450s plus a GST plus a transporter, what, what happens then is that increases the level of resistance. It allows it to detoxify herbicides at faster and faster rates. And so maybe initially you could have overcome this metabolic resistance by increasing the rate over time as the plant stacks these different mechanisms, you can overcome it by increasing the rate. And in addition, stacking these different mechanisms results in the plant expanding the spectrum of herbicides to which it's resistant. So here's a, a hypothetical example illustrating that. So maybe one plant has one particular P450 called P450X in this example. And then maybe that enzyme has, confers low level resistance to a, a group two herbicide, maybe modest resistance to a group four herbicide. But that's it, it still remains sensitive to other herbicides. Well, maybe you have another plant that has a GSTY, a particular GST glutathionase transferase, which confers modest resistance to, or, or I'm sorry, low level resistance to group four, low level resistance to group 15, and low level resistance to group 27 herbicides. And then another plant has a different GST, which confers low level resistance to group four and modest resistance to group 15. Well, what can happen then is a plant through crossing or through evolution, a plant could accumulate all three of these players. And so now this plant has resistance across all four of these groups with even, with, with even higher levels of resistance. So now modest, low resistance to group two, very high resistance to group four, and high resistance to group 15, and modest resistance to group 27. Okay, so I think you can see what's happened now. Now you can have plants that are resistant to a broader range of herbicides. Okay, and unfortunately, once these different enzymes, these mechanisms, uh, accumulate in a population, they typically don't go away. They just keep adding on to each other. The, the populations and the weed, the individual plants, just keep adding and stacking these mechanisms together. Okay. And so it causes us to lose the effectiveness, stepwise lose the effectiveness of a broader and broader range of herbicides. And so we can extrapolate this to get to reason four of why we should be concerned is as these these uh, populations are stacking these different metabolic resistance genes and expanding the spectrum of herbicides to which they're resistant. They're expanding that spectrum beyond currently used herbicides to encompass herbicides that have not even been discovered yet. And so that's a pretty scary thing. You know, all of you are aware that in the last few years, we've not seen a lot of, of new active ingredients and particularly completely novel active ingredients introduced into the market. It's very difficult for companies to, to discover and commercialize new herbicides because of regulatory issues and, 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 and lots of reasons. But now add on to the fact that some of these new herbicides may already have lost effectiveness before they've even been introduced into the market. And so I've actually heard from uh, at least, I know of at least two uh, incidences from different companies where they had a new herbicide active ingredient. They were excited about it. It looked very promising, but then they tested it out on some of these populations that have metabolic resistance, and they found that these populations were already resistant to this new herbicide, even though they'd never seen it before. And so the company made the decision that there was no need to move forward with this herbicide, and it was shelved uh, 
uh, and not advance through the R&D pipeline. So this is a major challenge. Um, as I said, it's already hard enough to identify new herbicides, and now we have populations that may already be resistant to them before they're even identified or used. Okay, so to summarize then, you know, why should we be concerned? This metabolic resistance confers unpredictable cross resistance, so we can't just mix and rotate our way out of it. It's definitely increasing. It's becoming more common in more and more of our weed species and in our weed populations. And these populations are steadily accumulating different genes that are expanding the spectrum of herbicides to which they are resistant, including herbicides that have yet to be discovered. So bringing this back to the end here, um, what are some of the take home messages here in terms of managing your weeds and, and, and manage this with this backdrop of, of what's going on in terms of metabolic resistance? So. You know, still, we still encourage you to mix and rotate effective herbicides with different sites of action, okay? Because as I, I said before, even though metabolic resistance is becoming more common, site of action resistance is not going away, and we still have to worry about that. And the best way from a chemical standpoint to manage and mitigate site of action resistance is to mix and rotate herbicides with different sites of action. So keep doing that. But be aware that this strategy is not going to prevent metabolic resistance. And in fact, it might even increase metabolic resistance, particularly if you're cutting the rates. So make sure you're using full rates. And this goes back to the idea of the multiple players. Early on in the evolutionary process, you might have just one of these players, maybe one P450 that's conferring very low resistance. And so if you're using the full rate, you can prevent that P450 from accumulating in the population. So Again, mix and rotate effective herbicides with different sites of action, use them at the full rate. But again, that's not going to prevent metabolic resistance. So how do we prevent metabolic resistance or at least delay it? Uh, at the end of the day, what we need to do is expose fewer weeds to herbicides. And that's a challenge. And that's a challenge that a lot of farmers don't like to hear. And how do we expose fewer weeds to, how do we expose fewer weeds to herbicides? Number one, use non-chemical strategies where you can, okay? Using crop rotations, using cover crops, using judicial, judicial use of tillage where you can to try and reduce your reliance on herbicides. And then equally important is to reduce the soil seed bank. Prevent weeds from going to seed in your field at the end of the season. Prevent weed seeds from moving into your field. Keep the borders clean, okay? Again, that takes a lot of work and that requires you to be scouting your fields and managing those fields more closely to make sure plants aren't going to seed um, to add to that soil seed bank. I really feel, you know, this, this final bullet point, um, this continued stacking of different herbicide metabolism genes in weeds is going to be the beginning of the end of the chemical era of weed control. And that's a pretty uh, kind of a dark statement, I think, right? For those of us that depend on herbicides for controlling weeds. I'm not saying we're going to stop using herbicides next year. We're going to continue to use them. But I think, you know, in the future, a decade from now, we may look back at this time in the, the history of weed management that this was where herbicides, we had to stop relying on herbicides. You know, it's similar to think back to glyphosate about a decade ago, we recognized that Glyphosate, the, you know, the beginning of the end of glyphosate as a standalone herbicide happened. Doesn't mean we stopped using glyphosate. We still use glyphosate, but we can't rely on it like we, like we used to be able to. And I think the same thing is gonna apply more broadly to herbicides due to this metabolic resistance. So with that, uh, really thank you for your attention. I hope you enjoyed the webinar. I hope you found it useful to you. And I'm certainly happy to address any questions or comments that any of you might have. Thank you very much. Thank you, Pat, for that uh, insightful information on metabolic herbicide resistance. Uh, we do have uh, questions in our Q&A box, but I would, before we start answering questions, I would take this opportunity to thank all of the university researchers and uh, weed scientists who participate and contribute to take action and, and develop this uh, excellent you know, extension material. And without their support, it would not have been possible. So uh, we do have questions. And um, the first question is, we do not have uh, metabolic resistance yet in uh, meristel or ragweeds. Uh, why do you think this is? And can we expect it to occur? 
So we do have some non-target site resistance in this species. And so glyphosate resistance is largely due to reduced translocation or sequestration of the glyphosate molecule, which is not exactly metabolism per se, but it's similar to this metabolism. So I would first make that point. Um, the other point I would make is that we tend to see more metabolic resistance in grasses. And we also tend to see more metabolic resistance in weeds that are able to outcross. And horseweed mare's tail is a primarily self-pollinated weed. And so that is probably slowing the rate of metabolic resistance. But I will say there's some other, um, some other weeds, uh, barnyard grass, for example, which is, is self-pollinated primarily, if I, I understand, if I remember correctly, which has quite a bit of metabolic resistance. And so I think it's, um, there's certainly going to be some weeds that are faster at this game than others, but as we go along, you know, I think all weeds have the potential to eventually evolve this metabolic resistance. Thank you, Pat. We have another question uh, that is, what research areas do you think plant scientists should focus on to better understand and manage metabolic resistance? I mean, one area is to manage metabolic resistance is to focus on non-chemical strategies, okay? Um, but in terms of the chemistry, the herbicide uh, angle to it, I think as we better understand how the different enzymes are metabolizing the herbicides, that will take some of the unpredictability out of it and we can predict it better. So that will be helpful where, you know, maybe at some point in the future, we can have a color coded chart. So like we have the color coded chart for target site resistance, maybe we can have a color coded chart for metabolic resistance saying, okay, these herbicides tend to be metabolized by the same enzyme but these herbicides aren't metabolized by that enzyme. And so we can rotate herbicides based on their metabolic potential. Um, and then the other would be to maybe figure out how we can use some of this metabolism against the weeds. And so maybe we can have the plant, instead of metabolizing the herbicide to detoxify it, maybe the metabolism step makes a molecule more toxic to the plant. And so you could use sort of this, um, uh, I won't say synergy, that's not the word I'm looking for, but using this sort of uh, negative cross resistance to make the plants more sense, make some plants that are capable of metabolizing herbicides more sensitive to other sort of pre-herbicide molecules or pro-herbicides. Thank you for that answer. And another question that we have here is, what proportion of U.S. acres uh, are with weed resistance known today is metabolic versus target site? Oh, it's really hard to put a number on that. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I would say, and these aren't exclusive of each other. In our water hemp populations here, we have plant, you know, within a field, you have some plants that have target site resistance, you have some plants that have metabolic resistance. And so, you know, it's really hard to answer that question. I would say to both target site and metabolic resistance are very common. They're intermixed with each other in different populations. You know, there's some specific type of resistances like ALS resistance, group two herbicide resistance, which is predominantly target site. But there's also metabolic resistance to that herbicide as well. And then there's other herbicides like maybe the group 27 herbicides, where as far, as far as I'm aware, there's no target site resistance and all of it is metabolic resistance. So it varies a little bit by herbicide and by species, but there's, there's a lot of common out or both are very common. Another question that we have here is, is there a trade-off uh, for plants to accumulate these metabolic resistance genes? Less seeds, less competitive canopy or something like that? Yeah, that's a really good question. So is there sort of a fitness cost? Yes and no. Um, there are probably some enzymes that when the plant accumulates them, there's a, there's a trade-off. And what happens is those don't accumulate and we don't study those. We tend to study the ones that don't have much of a trade-off because those are the ones that the plants evolve. And so mo I would say, you know, the short answer to that question is that for the most part, there's not much trade-off. And if there is a trade-off, it's, it's too small to really be useful for us as trying to manage it. And so what that means is when these enzymes accumulate, they tend to stay in the populations. Thank you. Uh, another question is, I think you touched on it a little bit earlier, but I will ask it anyways. Uh, what can we do to manage or overcome metabolic resistance in our fields? What can we do to manage metabolic resistance in our field? Prevent, yeah. I assume they mean prevent metabolic resistance um, or um, 
you know, again, it, it comes down to exposing less weeds to herbicides. Um, every time we expose weeds to herbicides, we have the potential to select for resistance. And so using non-chemical strategies to reduce the number of weeds in your field, um, not letting weeds go to seed, so they're not adding to the soil seed bank, um, and also, you know, killing those weeds that are escaped. So that's really important. You know, if, if a weed survives a herbicide because it has resistance, and then you go out and manually remove that weed before it produces seed, that will slow down resistance evolution very, very, very effectively. Another question that we have here is, uh, do smaller plants express metabolism or metabolic enzymes at lower frequency? If so, do you predict pre-emergence herbicide treatments to be more effective on these biotypes? Yeah, really good comment. And, and yes, in general, my, my short answer is yes. Uh, it's not always the case. Okay. Um, sometimes as plants get older, oftentimes as plants get older, they do express more enzymes and have more metabolic herbicide detoxification potential. And so using pre-emergence herbicides, um, we still really strongly recommend that not just for that reason, but in part because of that reason, the smaller plants tend to be less effective at metabolizing weeds, but, but we do have some metabolic resistance to pre-emergence herbicides already. Um, my colleague Aaron Hager is come giving a has a, a recording on that topic of group 15 resistance in in water hemp and so um, it can happen in smaller weeds but it's probably less likely to happen in smaller weeds. Thank you. Uh, another question that we have here is his first saying great presentation and then the question is what do you think the possibility and feasibility to group herbicides based on chemical handle? for effective control uh, of non-target based resistant weeds. Yeah, and so I talked a little bit about that. I, it, it's feasible, but it's gonna be very challenging. Uh, um, and and we're, we're gonna learn along the way, right? Because there's gonna, you know, you can only sort of make the predictions based on what enzymes we know. And there's gonna be new enzymes coming along. And so it's, it's probably never gonna be perfect, but it certainly can be, you know, right now we don't really have any very little predictive potential. So we're definitely gonna get more predictive potential. Um, certainly will never be as good as our predictive potential for cross resistance regarding target site resistance. So the other uh, question here is, what would be the best crop rotation to control water hemp? I think it's from your- The best crop rotation would be adding a perennial crop into the system. So like alfalfa. You know, water hemp is a summer annual weed. It does really well in summer annual crops like corn and soybeans. It does less well in a summer in a winter annual crop like wheat, and it doesn't do very well at all in a perennial crop that's that's you know forage used for forage. So if you can put a couple years, two, three, four years of your field into alfalfa, you're not going to get rid of the water hemp. There's still going to be some seed in the soil seed bank, but you're going to dramatically decrease the population. Great. Uh, next question here is. Are there any proteomics projects currently underway to better identify some of these enzymes that are specifically enabling metabolic non-target site resistance in certain weed species? Yeah, there's quite a bit of proteomics work. Uh, my colleague here, Dean Reekers at the University of Illinois is, is doing some, some really nice work and understanding metabolic resistance using proteomic approaches. Uh, I'm sure there's companies that are looking into that in a lot of detail. And again, it's, it's trying to understand these enzymes, what enzymes are involved, so that ultimately we can better predict, um, you know, what one go off, it's not the only go, but one go is better prediction of, of metabolic cross resistance. Thank you. We have another question. Um, how important is moving away from corn, soy crop rotation going to be in combating uh, metabolic resistance? Yeah, I mean, I think as, you know, my, my kind of my dark statement about the beginning of the end of the chemical era, we control as, as chemicals fail us more and more, and we don't have new chemistry to, to take over, um, it's going to be, we're going to become more and more dependent on non-chemical strategies. And the best non-chemical strategy, in my opinion, is crop rotation. And Unfortunately, the economics in the Midwest really makes corn soybeans the optimal rotation, but it's certainly not the optimal rotation for weed control and weed management. Thank you. Another question is, uh, it's a mouthful. I think it's a long question, but I'll try to read it. 
how do we objectively define decrease in effectiveness with respect to herbicide resistance? And then it says, when should we be concerned with control failure in field versus greenhouse? Since different researchers have different methodologies for resistance screening, should we uh, have some kind of consensus for baseline sensitivity for different herbicides? Basically asking, you know, how we define the resistance, yeah. basically. Uh, I think it really depends on your objective. You know, there's the farmer's objective. They want to know whether the herbicide works or not. Okay. And so if there's low level resistance that you can see in the greenhouse from a farmer's perspective, maybe you shouldn't call that resistance. But if there's low level resistance that you can see in the greenhouse and there's clearly a change that's taking place in this population, then we as scientists need to be aware of that and documenting that and studying that and studying the potential of that. So, you know, should there be a standard? I think that standard is going to vary depending upon what your outcome is. And there's, there's a difference between, you know, understanding it in the lab and managing it in the field. And the same standard is not going to apply to both. So the next question is, what do you think of potential utility of herbicide metabolism inhibitors for overcoming metabol metabolism-based resistance? Yeah, there, there's, there's potential. Um, it's difficult from a regulatory standpoint, which other people could speak better than I can, because now you're having to, regu you're having to uh, you know, get regulatory approval, not just for the herbicide, but for the inhibitor. Um, I think the other issue is the inhibitors are probably going to be pretty specific. And so as I talked about, you know, how this is a multi-step process that can involve lots of different enzymes, that means you're probably going to need a suite of different inhibitors, which is going to make it, again, a lot more complicated. So, so there may be I think some 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 fairly specific incidences where it could be effective approach, but it's not going to be a panacea for solving. I don't think it'll be a panacea for solving all the metabolic resistance problems. Next question here is: uh, Do you see potential in using genomics and uh, or RNA modification for herbicide resistance management? Well, certainly genomics is allowing us to understand a lot more about herbicide resistance and. It's also allowing us to investigate how weeds are adapting to other control strategies and giving us potential new targets for alternative strategies. Um, and then what the other part of the question was RNA interfering, small RNA molecules. On the um, modifications, yeah. For um, you know, there, there's potential, there's challenges, like a lot of things. Um, but, you know, necessity is the mother of invention, right? And so some of these technologies that might look very difficult now, you know, if, you know, we're not going to stop growing crops, weeds aren't going to go away. Um, but if the weeds evolve resistance and the herbicides don't work, we will come up with some other way of controlling them. Thanks. And the next question here we have is, how can applied university researchers uh, effectively screen for evolution of metabolic resistance? Is the use of residual herbicides, and, and there is another question in from the same um, Participant is the use of residual herbicides increasing the selection for metabolic resistance. So the first part of the question: How can uh, scientists uh, effectively screen? Um, you know, right now there's a few examples, but for the most part, um, it's the old-fashioned way of growing plants in the greenhouse and spraying. Um, are pre-emergence herbicides increasing um, resistance? I think, I mean, all herbicides are increasing metabolic resistance. I, I think I said it before, anytime you expose a plant to a herbicide, you're selecting for resistance mechanisms, including metabolic mechanisms. Um, you know, I, it's a good question. I don't know the answer because there's kind of two sides of that, right? We talked about exposing smaller plants to these pre-emergence herbicides. They're generally less able to metabolize those products. But at the same time, the plants are being exposed to low rates of herbicides because as the soil residual herbicides decrease in concentration over time, at the tail end, you have plants exposed to low, low herbicide rates, which we would expect to select for metabolic resistance. And so how those different sort of things work together. So yes, they're selecting for metabolic resistance. Are they selecting for it more than post products? I, I can't, I don't know the answer to that. Great. And uh, the last question actually fits, you know, this uh, series of webinars. It says, uh, do you see a practical fit for seed destructors in uh, row crop production? Before you try to answer this uh, question, uh, I would say that we have a seminar on that, you know, on um, January 27th, 
on harvest weed seed control uh, practices. So do you want to answer that or? I would, my answer is yes. I think it does have a place and tune into that seminar and, and you'll find out more. Yep, uh, that's all uh, questions that we had. Thank you again, uh, Pat. And that concludes our web webinar today. But before you uh, uh, part today, uh, I would say that we do have two more webinars coming up in this series. So be sure to come back next Thursday which is January uh, 20th for presentation on the value of residuals in herbicide resistant weed problems. Uh, and our presenter will be Dr. Larry Stackle from University of uh, Tennessee. Then the following uh, Thursday, which is uh, January 27th, Dr. Kevin Bradley from University of Nebra uh, Missouri, sorry, uh, will be presenting on harvest weed seed control practices. And all these sessions will be from 10 to 11 a.m. Central Time. And uh, visit www.iwilltakeaction.com uh, to register. And, and these presentations, uh, the recordings of these presentations will be made available on that uh, website, iwilltakeaction.com. Uh, with that, uh, thank you everyone uh, for joining us today. And thank you our, you uh, know, uh, back-end staff here, Robin and, and Kathleen as well. Thank you.